Hi, and welcome to today's Webin 8. It's all the power of a normal webinar packed into eight tight minutes. Today's topic, the top 10 causes of churn and how to stop them. The natural tendency of customers and vendors is to drift apart, not closer together. Let's say it another way. The natural tendency of all your customers is to churn. But is that true? Let's play it out. You make the sale, close the deal, then you do nothing. What happens? I think we can all agree that on a long enough timeline, everybody quits, cancels, or lapses. On a long enough timeline, everybody churns, 100%. Let's say it's 99.9%. .9%. And we see this play out in the data. This is a pretty standard SaaS retention chart. We almost always see the steepest drop-off during the onboarding process, an inflection point, and then a steady decline in users over time. Let's take a closer look at the 10 most common reasons why customers churn and how to stop them. I'll show you how to spot each one and give you a few steps you can take to prevent them. Number one, no return on investment. A lot of companies used to think about retention in terms of customer delight or customer happiness. In other words, customer experience. And it's important, that's true, but it's not necessarily correlated to retention. In fact, a great customer experience can mask underlying risk. We think about it like this. On a 2x2, two two, the x-axis is outcomes, or you could call it ROI or business value realization. It's, is the customer achieving their desired outcome with your product or service? And then the y-axis is experience. Does the customer like you? Are they happy with your company? Ideally, we want everybody to be up here in the top right, achieving outcomes, having great experiences. And we never want to be in the bottom right. No ROI, and they don't like you, obviously. But if your customers are here achieving value while also having a poor experience, they're usually not at risk of churn. They may detract you publicly, they may feel trapped, but they don't want to give up the value they're getting from your company. This could just mean there's not a lot of choice in your market. And this is where phone companies, ISPs, insurance companies, that's where they all live. Uh, but where you really start to get into churn trouble is right here. Great experience, no ROI. Customers will churn, but it will happen without warning because they really like you. They may even advocate for you on their way out the door. So how do you see this coming? Biggest telltale sign of this churn causes a decrease in usage or inactivity after sign-up. Obviously, this demands some kind of insight into usage. If you're in a SaaS company, you really should have access to this data. If not, you need to quantify what actions your customers take with your product to drive value, to get what they pay for, and figure out a way to track it. But whether you have that kind of data or not, having a clear understanding of your client's definition of ROI and the objective criteria they need to meet to achieve it is critical. How to stop it? Yes, you need to be focused on improving product stickiness and driving adoption, but equally as important is reinforcing that ROI constantly. Are you sharing adoption numbers with your customers? Are you telling them in dollars how much your product or service is putting back into their pocket? Number two, stalled implementation. A beginning is a very delicate time. Customers are antsy to get started, but they can lose momentum easily. If your customers don't see value early, they can quickly become a churn risk. Telltale signs, if they don't get the product operational on time, if they fail to see initial value soon enough. If you remember that retention chart I showed you at the beginning of the Web 8, the highest leverage moment is during onboarding. The smallest increase in adoption will result in the biggest difference in retention over the long term. Now, a lot of people think about onboarding as a limited engagement, but it's actually ongoing. It never stops. Training new users and re-engaging old ones should be happening continuously. So find out what features are driving value and focus on deepening user adoption through training and broadening that use among the user base at your customer and do it early. If you have a complex product, it helps to break up the implementation into smaller phases. Number three, sponsor change. Not everyone who works at your company cares equally about your product. You'll have casual users, powered users, champion stakeholders, people who don't know about you at all. If you're a buyer, admin, or power user and you leave the company, you're in big trouble. Telltale signs, your key contact goes dark. How to stop it? Come up with an early warning system. Maybe even keep tabs on your sponsor's LinkedIn. But most importantly, don't put your eggs in one basket. Identify backup sponsors and train them and communicate with them to get to the point where your relationship isn't dependent on any one person. Number four, low product adoption. What were your customers doing before they had you? It's easier to revert back to your old status quo if you run into problems with your current solution. Have you had a drop off in usage? or maybe it's just low across the board. This is great white space for collaborating more closely with your product team. Find out why your features aren't sticky enough and look for in-product ways to re-engage users and get them back into healthy habits. Number five, your customer gets acquired by a company with a different solution. This one's tough. You read about it in the news or your customer reaches out to tell you they're suddenly using your competitor. You've gotta treat this like a competitive new deal cycle. 
Engage your sales team. If you have strong proof of the value you've driven for this company, you'll have a fighting chance. That's why it's always great to collect case studies and advocacy from your clients at every opportunity. Number six, you've got product gaps. Just because your customer was happy and healthy a year ago doesn't mean they are now. If your product has been passed and key features are priced by the market, you could be in trouble. Your customer is asking for new features, enhancements, or asking you for a better price. How you stop it? You need a system to constantly collect new feature requests and feed them back into your product team. I'm always surprised by how often CS teams aren't really communicating with product managers. On the other hand, how well do you know your product roadmap? Are you communicating it to your customers through regular webinars and demos? Engaging your customers in the development process is a great way to deepen your relationship and get invaluable feedback from your biggest stakeholders. Number seven, new leadership or strategy. Let's say your customer gets a new CEO or the current CEO changes their overall strategy. How does your product fit into the new plan? What if it doesn't fit? Telltale signs you probably just got an RFP of some kind. And how you stop it? You gotta get proactive and arrange a meeting with the leader of the new strategic direction. I can't stress enough how important it is to get ahead of this. You wanna be the first to make your case for how your product can drive value in this new world. Number eight, performance issues. This one's all about poor execution. Whether it's a product issue, a support issue, a services snag, if you're not executing well, your customers pay the price. And then you do when the renewal comes up. Telltale signs, you see an increased volume of unresolved support tickets or escalations. Now this one's tough to stop because there's a certain threshold of support tickets that is a sign of customer health, not risk. The more support tickets you get, the more your customer is engaging with the product to a certain extent. If those tickets go unresolved too long, or if there's just too many of them, it's very bad. Are you tracking support tickets and escalations? Do you know where your threshold is when it crosses that line between healthy and unhealthy? Number eight, your product is not the right solution. Your sales model let you down, you sold into a poor product fit. Either they're trying to use your product to do something it just doesn't do very well, or your team oversold the product. Your customer seems like they don't have an accurate understanding of what you do. They're asking for features that aren't in your wheelhouse. In this case, you might not want to stop it, and you might not be able to stop it. In many cases, it can actually be less costly to eat the churn as opposed to pouring resources into services or support or engineering to make a square peg, a square peg fit a round hole. On the flip side, you need to be doing better to align with sales and marketing on what a good customer fit looks like. Number 10, last one, the human factor. Customers are human. They're made up of human beings and so is your company. If you're listening to this webinar, you are a human being too. Sometimes human beings do weird things or behave in complex ways for complex reason. And that's a good thing, but it could also result in weird churn cases you don't always understand. You get negative feedback in a survey, a meeting, or a call, or online in a public review. Well, you're, you're taking feedback, right? Don't ignore it. You need to respond to it. Take action to address it, and then close the loop by telling your customers what you did. There's a huge gap between companies that ask for feedback and those who actually act on it. Today's webinar was 100% based off of this excellent book. It's called Customer Success, How Innovative Companies Are Reducing Churn and Growing Recurring Revenue by... Dan Steinman, Nick Mehta, and Lincoln Murphy. It's got everything you need to know about customer success. I highly recommend you check it out. You can find a link to it in this webpage.